Today on the Milk of Odd Humla, I welcome Wyoming State Archaeologist Dr. Spencer Pelton. Dr. Pelton has been the head archaeologist for the state of Wyoming since November of 2019. His current research interests include geoarchaeology and site formation, high plains and Rocky Mountains prehistory, hominin thermoregulation, and new world colonization. He has conducted excavations at the Powers Two Red Ochre Quarry, the Sisters Hill site, and the La Priel Mammoth site, among others. He received his Bachelor's of Science from Middle Tennessee State University, his Master's from Colorado State University, and his PhD from the University of Wyoming. Go Cowboys! He has specialized and published many papers on high elevation game drives and communal hunting, Paleo-Indian chronology, and the North American overkill hypothesis. Spencer, thank you for joining us, and welcome to the Milk of Adhumla. Thanks for having me, Greg. It's a real okay. pleasure to be interviewed by you today. Thanks, man. All right, we're going to launch right into it. Um, the first question or discussion I want to I want to hear you talk about is um, you've been working on these Clovis er era sites um, in Wyoming, and one of the things that you've discovered is, as far as I understand it, is that the people were transporting red ochre from the Powers Two site, the quarry. Um, to the La Priel Mammoth site. And first of all, am I saying these right? And second of all, describe how you guys figured this out, how you came to this conclusion, and then what that tells us about maybe ritual behaviors or certain values that these people had. So first, powers two, correct. La Priel, not correct. La Prel. <laughs> La Prel. <laughs> Okay. Laprel, so named after Laprel Creek, which runs right by the site. Okay. Um, so Powers Two is is a hematite quarry. Red, red ochre is what we call it when it when it shows up in an archaeological site. Um, basically, just a red paint. But when it comes out of the ground, it's it's actually silver. Hematite in its natural form is oftentimes has a silvery hue to it. Uh, and Powers Two is one of only uh, four hematite quarries that have have been identified thus far this far in the in the Americas. Uh, there's one in, in North America and at the Powers 2 site. There's one that was recently discovered in the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, there's one in Peru and there's one in, in Chile. And, and that's it. So it's a, it's a really rare kind of site type, uh, probably because hematite often crops out around iron mines and, and other mineral deposits. So a lot of the archaeological evidence for hematite quarrying in prehistory has probably been been wiped out by by industrial mining activities uh, dating back to you know 1500s in a lot mm. of places. But here at Powers Two, we have this really rare, exceptional site that dates back to the early Paleo Indian period between about uh, about 12,700 and about 12,100 years ago, where people were uh, quarrying hematite out of this vein of soft ochre, uh, and in the process, depositing a ton of artifacts and digging tools and other things like that. Uh, so the Lapral site, on the other hand, is, is a, a mammoth kill and an associated campsite. And it's located about 80 kilometers away from the Powers II site, uh, just right up upstream, um, up the North Platte River from, from the Powers II site. Uh, we started investigating the, the Lapral site about 2014. Uh, and, and really, I, I've been kind of a, a minor member of that team since then. It's really Todd Suravel, and especially Madeline Mackey has been the one that's really uh, published extensively on the Laprel site, although I've, I've maintained uh, some, some roles in that project as well. So shortly after investigating Laprel, we came upon this um, red ochre stain associated uh, with the mammoth, about 15 meters away from the mammoth. And, and, and uh, in excavating it, found that ochre stain was associated with uh, a ton of stuff that you would expect to find in, in a Paleo-Indian campsite, stone tools, flakes, bone, and also really rare things like uh, bone needles, found a bone bead in this ochre stain. Um, and 
you know, all of those things together, plus some spatial analysis we did, suggested that that red ochre stain was actually the footprint of a house that was built next to this mammoth, uh, probably where people lived briefly while butchering this mammoth, dealing with the mammoth meat, that kind of thing. Um, you know, based on the lithics we found in that, that house, we had a pretty good idea that that red ochre was coming from Powers II because the chert that outcrops around the Powers II site was the chert we were finding in this house, about 80 kilometers away from its source location. But we really wanted to, to nail down a definitive um, source location for the hematite. Uh, the method that, that was used, uh, and this was really um, done by, by a woman named Sandra Zarzyshka, was the one that published this study, uh, but I was also a part of it. Uh, she used uh, a method called inductively coupled mass spectrometry. So uh, a, really, a really fancy term for a fancy method that basically says uh, uh, we broke down uh, the elements in it and, get, and got a reading of all the trace elements in, in the ochre from both the Powers II site and in the Laprelle site. And by comparing those two sources, we, we made a pretty definitive case to yes, the, the ochre we were finding at the Laprelle site was indeed from this hematite quarry at Powers II. Uh, as far as what that means, uh, I, I don't know, but here, here's my thoughts on it and, and what I usually say about red ochre. Uh, I think red ochre in general is one very small component, uh, if, if it is a component, of, of whatever ritual system or belief system these people had uh, 13,000 years ago. Um, when, when you think about the rituals we maintain in our lives, you know, very, very, uh, a very small component of it's actually material. And of those materials that represent our rituals, very small number of those are non-perishable. So what we're finding is just the small component of this ritual or belief system that's non-perishable and that ends up in the archeological record. Um, of course, rituals are also accompanied by dancing and singing and storytelling and all sorts of things like that, right? So the red ochre, if it is, some indication of ritual or belief system that's a very small component of it. Um, and, and beyond that, I, I usually stress that, uh, you know, red ochre is obviously one of the earliest forms of symbolic behavior in, in the hominid lineage. It's really the first thing that we find in Africa that we associate with, with symbolic belief. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it was uh, kind of a I guess I'll use George Frizen's terms, it doesn't necessarily mean there's a lot of hocus pocus around it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about the majority of the rituals that we do in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, we don't really even think about that much. Mm -hmm. um, it's like you know, cracking a beer when you get home from work or um, you know, turning the lights off when you leave a room, all these, all these small things. And I kind of think of it as ochre is fulfilling a role like that. You know, when you talk to, to modern Native American communities, they really talk about it as just kind of a, uh, something that you put on when you want a little more power in the world. Um, so you put it on your kid and on his first day of school or um, when, when uh, somebody passes away, you put ochre on, um, th things like that. And so I, I don't necessarily think that the ochre at the Laprelle site necessarily had a, um, a very profound kind of religious or ritual significance. It could have just been that they had a successful hunt. We have this ochre with us. Let's have a little party and everybody, everybody paint themselves a little bit to celebrate, something like that. Just a little something more to make the, make the event special and kind of separated it from the, the day-to-day -day, uh, mundane routines of your life. Um, that, that's the way I think about it. Uh, we'll, we'll obviously never know, but I, I think that the fact that it's in the context of a house as opposed to say like uh, a burial or something like that mm -hmm. means that in, in this case it kind of served a, a pretty uh, pretty mundane if, if still symbolic uh, uh, meaning to the people that were using it there. I like that description and, and I um, I like your interpretation of it because yeah it doesn't have to be whoa you know in the hocus pocus factor um, because, yeah, if you really think about it, it's something that was naturally occurring in their environment. 
and we love to adorn ourselves you know and we have lots of different clothes that we put on and sometimes women will put on mascara or a man does something with his hair or his beard and yeah when there's a special occasion going on we do something a little extra you know and yep. so yeah i've always kind of felt about it that same way you know i'm i'm pretty positive at this point in time they had people that you could consider in the shamanic realm because we have the we have mammoth kill sites in siberia also that looks like there was some sort of rich things that point to uh, what's the term i you know i keep going back to the term shaman because nothing else really encapsulates that but somebody who's an intermediary with the animal spirits or nature power or whatever and you'd think at a kill site some uh, uh, some sort of professional that was dealing with you know the spirit world would um be there and so yeah having some sort of celebration after you kill a mammoth of course there's going to be lots of food being cooked you know the things that you need to eat that day and so there's going to be people around preparing things you know pounding out sinew stretching hides wrapping up intestines and all kinds of things and yeah it was probably a big party and if I'm thinking if if I'm either an old man or maybe I'm a young brave that wants to impress some girls, I'm gonna put on some red ochre for sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and I should say uh, the red ochre from the Powers Two site is especially, uh, well, it's beautiful. I mean, when when you uh, dig in the site, um, it has this like lustrous silvery sheen to it, and it coats wow. you all over, all over your face, all over your arms and hands. I mean, and it, and it literally is makeup. I mean, the, the hematite from this iron mine was used by makeup companies in the early 20th century to produce rouge uh, and lipstick and stuff. Uh -huh. it, it literally is makeup uh, in, in the way we, we think about it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, in the same way people put on, put on makeup or get done up or put on your nice clothes when you want to celebrate a special occasion, uh, you would probably apply ochre in, in similar situations in the past i would guess uh, after you killed an enormous animal and you had food for the next couple months <laughs> because of it you know this is something i've been thinking about a lot and you're probably the perfect person to ask but i've kind of developed this vision of kill sites and it, it's a some somewhat educated opinion and idea and, and but somewhat not i don't claim to be a professional but it just seems like, you know, a mammoth was such a big animal. And if you kill one, you have a huge amounts of work that needs to be done. And so um, I'm, I'm envisioning, you know, these campsites with just so many things going on. You know, people cutting meat, drying meat, people making fires, cooking, making thread with sinew. Maybe you're in a place where there's a certain plant or tuber that's coming into that time of year so people are collecting plants there's going to be big communal fires people talking maybe old men telling stories young kids learning how to flint nap or learning about plants or animal tracks or whatever and it just and you mentioned finding a a, a bone needle and and a, and a bead and uh, to me that kind of makes sense because if you're if you have all these new hides and sinew for thread and bone and stuff like that maybe it was a time also that people would be doing some repairs on clothing or making new clothing that's kind of my vision of like this big camp with lots of activity going on and on many many different levels you know kids running around being crazy young men and women off coupling and making new alliances and things like that is that kind of how you see it like you've you've probably spent a lot of hours at mammoth sites and other kinds of kill sites the high game drives is that kind of what you envision at these camp sites yeah absolutely especially with with mammoth sites. So the, what's really special about the Laprell site is it, it it kind of fits this model that you're describing and that and that people that have studied colonization of the Americas have proposed for a long time. It's a mammoth that has clusters of artifacts seemingly around it. 
that look like they represent household units. And the, the original model of new world colonization, one of, one of the first ones that was proposed was that these people were highly mobile, specializing in big game, and that you wouldn't necessarily central place forage like you see in, in hunter gatherers today. You would kill a big animal and move your entire camp to that animal to, to perform these activities and to hang out for a while. And while your camp's set up at that animal, you're breaking it down, living off of it for weeks or however long, then some segment of your population's off to look for the next big animal. And then when they find that and they kill it, then you move your camp to that next one and you do the same thing over again. And so what it looks like at La Pro is kind of a, a classic example of this, this mobility model of uh, an example of where people actually uh, killed a mammoth, moved their camp to it, set up shop for a while, sat there, sewed clothing, uh, played in some ochre for a while, uh, processed this animal, uh, did, did, you know, just live life as a hunter-gatherer 13,000 years ago in, in North America and then, and then moved on. Um, so it's a really interesting snapshot in time of this life way in, in a way that you don't get a whole lot of in archaeological sites. It's truly one of these kind of like Pompeii scenarios where this short-term event was preserved really, really well. There's no archaeology below it, no archaeology above it. It's just mm. this one event preserved that probably represents a couple weeks of time. And, uh, and it's, it's here 13,000 years later for us to study. It's, pretty, it's really remarkable for that reason. That the, the artifact yields from the site are pretty modest, honestly. Uh, mo most mm -hmm. of the artifacts that we found from that site are smaller than the end of your pinky, just tiny little retouch flakes. But um, you know, when you study these things in a lot of detail and you can actually map out these what look like house footprints where people were living, it ends up being a pretty remarkable picture of, of life that, that long ago. It's pretty amazing. I was going to ask you that if it looked like the site had been revisited, but it sounds like not. There's nothing below, nothing above. Yeah, one one use. That, that's it. Wow. And uh, yeah, we've done excavations both below it and above it. You always get people always get criticized for not digging below a Clovis, right? Because it it's, <laughs> uh, you don't look for it. But yeah, we look for it. It's not there. And uh, there's also nothing above it. <laughs> nice. How was it originally found? Was it part of a, a, a building site or something, building a road or excavating gravel or something? Or There's uh, some locals that were walking cut banks looking for archaeology back in the 80s. And um, they, found, they found mammoth bones eroding out of, out of this cut bank. And um, uh, George Frizen was the first one to excavate mm -hmm. it back in the 80s. And, and he found a couple stone tools in the, in the bones. And uh, but since then, people people had questioned whether or not it was actually a mammoth kill or or if it was an accidental association between tools and bones. Mm -hmm. and, and really, the purpose of going back there in the first place was to you know, confirm or refute that it was a mammoth kill. And it, it, it ended up turning into something a lot bigger than that when we really started intensively investigating nice. it. Lucky find uh, or good find. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Um, now, kind of talking also about, you know, hunting patterns in the Paleolithic. Um, you were involved, and I remember this from back at CSU, in looking at the high altitude game drives. Now, talk a little bit about that. Now, this was kind of different, right? In that these were places that were part of and tell me if I'm wrong again, if this was part of a seasonal round where people would go back to certain areas over and over again because they knew that the game would be moving through and then they were trying to direct them in a certain way so that they could then harvest from these moving herds. Talk a little bit about these high altitude game drives and what the people were doing there. And was are these sites um, older or younger than La Prelle? What's the chron chronology with the high altitude game sites also? Uh, so the, the front range of, the, of Colorado has, has these really remarkable game drives. And it's really the only place in, in the West that, that I've been able to find that has these things. Uh, these are pretty massive, uh, oftentimes containing several kilometers of rock walls and cairns. 
uh, game drive systems, oftentimes in, in V-shaped configurations. So very, very literally a corral where uh, you'd start out with a lot of animals at, at the open side of the V and you'd force them into tighter, tighter space. And then you'd have this kill area right at the apex. Um, and these things were oftentimes occupied uh, multiple times, maybe maybe not seasonally, but certainly uh, every, every few seasons or something to hunt. Uh, and this was about you know 1,500 years ago, maybe maybe starting as early as about 3,000 years ago. So you know, paleo Indians hunting mammoths and, and bison, uh, they had they kind of had America to themselves. Um, they had very low population densities uh, to an extent that. You could really just go wherever you wanted and kill what kill whatever you wanted, uh, and you didn't have to hunt the same places over and over again. But uh, of course, between thirteen thousand and, and three thousand years ago, uh, Native Americans in North America had a lot of babies, and, and those babies grow at exponential rates. So by the time three thousand years comes around, you have orders of magnitude more people on the landscape than you did thirteen thousand years ago, and you don't have the luxury to just move wherever you want. You really have to, what we call intensify your resource base and get as much out of it as you can. And these big reoccupied game drives in the front range, I think are very much uh, an indication of that. It's probably people living uh, in the winter in the front range, uh, probably in, in pretty substantial villages with semi-permanent structures. And then going up into the mountains during the summer to to hunt these patches of, of game resources, probably bighorn sheep, perhaps bison, and probably just whatever wandered into their trap at the time. Um, uh, and it's really these hunting structures are like I like I alluded to earlier. They're they're really exceptional in, in their scale and also just the number of them that are so packed into the front range. Uh, there's hunting facilities and other mountain ranges in the west, but really nothing like the front range. And I, I think it's purely a function of uh, the relief that you have in the front range. You have um, a really readily accessible alpine zone from a very warm foothills area. So within a day's hike, basically, you could be from the foothills of the front range down by Boulder, Loveland area, up into the alpine zone of, of, of Colorado. So you can access this really abundant a game resource really relatively easily and and probably transport meat and, and hides and other animal products that you harvested in those places back to camps in the front range pretty easily as well. So it's, it's a very different system than, than Paleo Indians were practicing, but uh, you know, a, re a really interesting one, one that's truly intensified and, and catered towards supporting really large numbers of people. Got it. Now, it, I'm thinking about tools now at the game drives, did they have bow and arrow at that time? Would they have been using bow and arrow or was this still addle addle? Uh, they, they probably, judging from the points on those sites, they probably used both in those game drives. Mm. Um, you know, they were hunting out of these little windbreak pits that you know both concealed the hunters and also provided some, some warmth because it is super cold in the Alpine zone, even in the summer a lot of the times. So I think, yeah, both bow, bow and arrows and, and adolatils are probably used in those systems. Okay, gotcha. Now, have you worked at any um, buffalo jumps? Because that's another thing that's pretty common in the, on the front range and high plains are buffalo jumps. Have you worked on any of those excavations? Yeah, I've worked on uh, the most extensively uh, I've worked on a bison jump. Is the it's called the Wold Bison Jump. It's in it's on the eastern slope of the Bighorn Mountains, um, close to the town of KC, Wyoming. If you're familiar with that, probably not. It's like 100 people, but <laughs> it's it's in that area in that area called the the Hole in the Wall country of of the Southern Bighorns, where some outlaws hit out there for a while. So um, it was really difficult to access, really cliffy terrain there, and uh, we excavated a bison jump there several years ago. Uh, it looks like it's a single event, uh, but also it, very comparable to the, the hunting facilities up in the front range, a V-shaped corral leading up to the jump point. And when you look at these bison jumps all throughout the Northern Plains, uh, it's very much a similar technique. You have these really long V-shapes extending way out into the, we call it gathering basin. And, and the process of jumping would just be to uh, kind of spook the bison enough to, to 
confine them more and more into these V-shaped corrals until you get pretty close to the cliff, a cliff edge and then you just spook them real good and push them off the edge of the cliff. And uh, so that, that's the one I've worked most extensively on. That was, yeah, that was a bison jump that um, occurred around 80, 1450, something like that, 1500. So oh, pre, wow. pre contact uh, pre, pre Columbian, but, uh, but really late in prehistory. Uh, and I, I made the argument in, in the paper that we wrote up, up, up about that, that the, the crow are the ones that, that operated that jump. And the thing about bison jumps was bison jumps are really not common in Wyoming. Mm. Uh, and, and really the, the southernmost bison jump that's universally accepted is, is just north of Fort Collins in Colorado. Um, bison jumping is very much a, a Montana, Alberta, Saskatchewan mm. kind of thing. Okay. Northern and in those areas, bison jumping starts happening probably about, about 5,000 years ago and, and pretty much continuously occurs uh, throughout that time up until contact. And it's not until really uh, about AD 1400 where we start seeing little hints of bison jumping down in Wyoming. And, and the argument that I made was that was, that was um, coincides really closely in time with when the crow started coming into Wyoming as well, kind of coming down the Yellowstone River into the Bighorns and, and further south. And so I, I made the argument just really based on timing and, and location that that was probably um, an ancestral crow site. Uh, but, you know, bison jumping is one of these things. It's, it's not like anybody can do it. It's, it's a really sophisticated hunting technique. It takes an enormous amount of people all cooperating really closely with each other. It takes a really sophisticated knowledge of how bison behave and, and how they behave on certain types of landscape features. And in, in my mind, it's just not something that you can just pick up and decide to do one weekend. It really has to be uh, the culmination of generations of, of knowledge, uh, and really a, a tradition of doing this. And, and for that reason, I think it makes sense that that, that uh, tradition was imported into Wyoming with a certain group as opposed to just kind of diffusing through an existing population. Uh, the cool thing also about that jump, about the wool jump, my, my colleague Bridget Grund, who works uh, for the BLM in Wyoming, she conducted an analysis that said um, that the visibility of the cliff edge where the bison were jumped off of was the most deterministic factor in where that jump was positioned on the landscape. Because uh, mm. the interesting thing about it is to get, in, to get into this jump, the people actually had to push bison up this really steep embankment, like really, really steep. And, and uh, it just didn't seem intuitive that you'd do that. Like it, it's intuitive to think that you push animals down kind of like, like they'd flow like water mm -hmm. off the edge of a cliff. Mm -hmm. down, yeah. Uh, least resistant. But to get the bison into this jump, you actually had to push them up a steep hill and then off this one really specific part in the cliff. And, and her argument was that, um, they went to all the effort and position to where it was simply because they knew um, how bison would respond to the site of a cliff edge and position that jump in the place that that cliff edge was most obscured until the very last second of the of the jump. Wow. So yeah, really, really cool results from that. Um, I'll talk about this a little later, but we've also been doing some work on the Vore Buffalo jump, which is a little different scenario. And uh, uh, but I'll, I'll talk about that a, a little bit. Okay, good. Yeah, let's save that. You mentioned the crow and migrating down into Wyoming, and you have studied and written a lot about um, migration. Now, again, with the DNA and more finds, um, more hard finds and analysis, there's many migration theories now. Well, not many, but more than Clovis first. And of course, you know, why didn't you dig below Clovis? And so what are your feelings now on the migration? Like, you know, it's more and more popular to think that instead of just coming through the two ice sheets from Beringia and on down, that there could have been a coastal migration. There's even people saying there would, I don't remember what the paper was. You might, you might know. There was a paper from a site in California that they were talking about 30,000 years old. And um, I don't remember who the authors were. I'll have to look that up and, and come back and add a note onto the video. But 
you know, things like that, like pushing the time back. And then there was the Solutrian hypothesis that doesn't seem like it's really had a lot of backers. There hasn't been enough evidence. What are your kind of feelings about the possibilities? Um, you know, uh, we're, we're pretty darn sure they came over from Siberia through Beringia and down. At least that was a major migration. What do you think about the coast? What do you think of possibilities of actually crossing the ocean, you know, from Polynesia and coming to South America? How did they get to South America so fast? I, have we just not found enough artifacts yet? What's going on with migration? <laughs> I'm pretty old school, Greg. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I think, so I think for practical purposes, we should still consider the Clovis archeological culture as the colonizing population in the Americas. Uh, I don't discount the notion that there was people before Clovis, but I don't think that they were viable reproductive populations. I think that they were um, basically ex explorations um, mm -hmm. prior, prior to colonization. And I, I don't think you can count explorations as a colonizing event. Mm -hmm. um, I still think that the burden of proof lies uh, extremely heavily on, on the Clovis archeological culture being the first culture and, and having come through the ice free corridor. Um, I, I don't discount the notion that perhaps uh, there was a terrestrial migration uh, along the coast of, of Canada, basically. But I think that as soon as you were able to uh, come inland and exploit large, naive terrestrial resources, you would do that. Um, I, I don't see any evidence for there being a truly uh, uh, coastal adaptation in any of the earliest archeological sites. I know that that's, we could say Mona Verde is an exception, maybe some of the shell mounds in the Channel Islands, but um, I won't get into all that. I just, I don't, I don't buy it. Uh, Solutrian seems unfeasible as, as does any, any oceanic journey. Um, I think that uh, the next evidence we see for serious voyaging doesn't occur until maybe uh, 1,000, 1,500 years ago in the colonization of like Polynesia, Micronesia. Uh, I don't think that people would have had that technology and lost it um, oh, for, for 10,000 years at least and then regain it again. Um, yeah, I, I think that the, the burden of proof still lies, lies with Clovis. It's just, it's... Uh, there's a lot of that stuff and there's very little of anything before it and the stuff that is before it is all really weird and has to be explained away in such uh, painstaking detail that it's that it uh it doesn't make any sense there's not there's not like just a mundane pre-clovis site it's like a single component campsite with an unambiguous hearth and some stone tools and some bone around it um there's always something weird about it um, so in, until we find something like that, I'm still, I'm still Clovis first, man. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should say, I should qualify that by saying Clovis is the first colonizing population. Uh, yeah. not to say that there's some explorers trickling in before that. The, the way I always put it is, um, you, you always look over the next hill before you move your wife and kids over there. Right. So mm -hmm. I don't, there's never been a pop a colonizing or a migrating population where there wasn't people that went before to scope out the terrain and figure out how to live there before moving your entire society there to actually make a living. So I don't discount that notion, but I think for practical purposes and for like setting a date on when colonization actually happened in the new world, Clovis still makes the most sense to me for that. And uh, I, and I should say, you were talking about Saruti in, in Southern California, 120,000 years old. Uh, Saruti is really weird. Um, you know, I, archaeologists love to shit on Saruti because it kind of <laughs> it kind of rewrites a lot of things. But I, you know, I don't I don't discount it as easily. I don't think it's an archaeological site, but I don't think that existing archaeological models about site formation can really fully explain everything they documented there. So if there's some piece of the puzzle we're missing where uh, you know something is weird. Something weird is happening probably in the paleontological record that we don't quite understand and can't fully explain. But uh, I think that the idea that it's an archeological site, it just, 
it relies upon too many, upon rewriting too many stories of prehistory from basically. That's a big leap, man. That's a big over. leap. Yeah, it's a big leap. Big leap. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's, a, that's a hard one. Um, yeah, that's a hard one to stomach, but yeah, I like, I like your idea of, um, you know, the colonizing population because yeah, there could have been exploring groups, even, even things like single individuals that become outcasts or something and they end up just going and that could, that can happen. You know, you, it's one thing that I, always want to remember that these were human beings with human nature and some people do crazy things and so um there you know there definitely could have been small groups or somebody coming and yeah not colonizing they're not they're not a a, a population that ends up staying heck even even viking groups from norway and other places in scandinavia came to nova scotia and they didn't stay you know, yeah, you can see where they, they had a camp and a, a little uh, uh, community for a while, but that was it. So, yeah, that can definitely happen. Interesting. That's actually a good example. The, the, Viking, the Viking presence in, in Canada is uh, it's a good example of probably not a reproductively viable group. I mean, I, I don't know a whole lot about that site, Lancy Meadows, but my understanding was it seemed like kind of a, a, a basically a workshop, mm -hmm. like a place to repair a place to repair boats and maybe live mm -hmm. for a season, not a village where you had a viable society. Right. Yeah. It kind of seemed like from, I, I've read just a few articles on it and it, yeah, it seems like a place where they weren't sure they wanted to stay, you know, they were like, they were checking it out and yeah, like you said, repairing things and thinking about what they wanted to do. And obviously they ended up not wanting to stay for whatever reason. Um, nope. Yeah. Kind of like when Scandinavian Northern Europeans go to the jungle, they may decide they don't <laughs> want to stay at some point. <laughs> Too damn hot. Um, now, <laughs> talking about climate, <laughs> um, you've um, talked a little bit about climate change and uh, prehistoric humans, and in particular during the Holocene period. And um, talk a little bit about technological adaptations um maybe uh, uh behavioral adaptations that groups go through when climate changes and how that affects you know migration and and global movement and global migration patterns could you talk about that a little bit uh the thing the thing i've done most with this is really um uh, my dissertation about thermal regulation um my dissertation is about how people keep warm when it's cold and how people keep cool when it's hot and how that influences the archaeological record and human movements across landscapes mm -hmm. really from a, from a from a big scale from basically like how did that basic necessity dictate the, the timing and nature of global human dispersal um we, we talk a lot about in those time scales archaeologists talk a lot about subsistence and how that how that's kind of impacted the trajectory of, of human social evolution. And I thought, well, you know, food, water, and shelter are really the, the three main things that you know, determine human survival. We've done a lot with food and water, but very little with shelter. And uh, that was really where I was, where I was getting at. We're kind of neglecting, in my mind, neglecting this huge aspect of, of human survival and, and human uh, behavior that, that's, uh, that we think, that we do every day, but never think about. Uh, you know, putting on a jacket when it's cold out, sitting in the shade when it's hot out, these kind of fundamental things that underlie our behavior. Um, I, the, the gist of my, my thesis was really that uh, cold, cold temperatures were really what kept modern humans, behaviorally modern humans, from colonizing the globe because they had to come up with a really complicated suite of technologies to deal with that before they started colonizing places like Lake Baikal in Siberia or places much further north, like the Yana site above the Arctic Circle. So you needed things like really complex fitted garments, which has been talked about a lot. You needed houses, uh, which there, there, there is no evidence for houses before behaviorally modern humans enter Eurasia. Um, and I know that uh, people get a lot of flack for saying caveman, 
and, and really reducing archaic hominins in Eurasia to, to dwelling in caves. But uh, th there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that term, and it's that we've never found a house that, that's been, uh, that was made by an archaic hominin uh, ever, as, as far as I know. Um, so before we had houses, we, yeah, we lived in caves a lot. You had to live in caves because it's really the only naturally occurring shelter that could, could moderate temperature. So uh, the way I think about this is, is really what modern humans brought to the table when they started dispersing globally was um, uh, a more complicated suite of ways to thermoregulate, which thereby uh, enhanced their capacity to survive in these landscapes and enable them to outcompete existing archaic continents on those land on those landscapes. So while while Neanderthals were sleeping in caves because it was too cold to do anything, our uh, modern humans could be out hunting in complex fitted garments, living in houses, expanding their niche to places that weren't bound to cave systems, uh, out onto the great the, the plains of uh, Russia and Siberia, and and really that. Thermoregulation really was the factor that led to their success in, in being able to, uh, to, to colonize the globe. Uh, and then of course, by the time they get to the, the Bering land bridge, they pretty much acquired every thermoregulatory technology they needed to survive on the planet because they're above the Arctic Circle. So by the time they hit um, the Americas, they could colonize it extremely rapidly because then the technology associated with getting into warmer and warmer environments was relaxed. You didn't know you didn't have to build houses anymore. You didn't have to wear clothes anymore, and you could colonize the Americas extremely rapidly. They arrived in the New World with a toolkit that was incredible, like like the most you know gearhead mountaineer would love the equipment exactly. that they had. Like they probably had, like I would trade in my equipment for what they had, um, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, yeah, that's pretty, that's, uh, pretty amazing. Um, so, so you're kind of saying it, it was the cold that really drove, uh, they had to adapt by creating new, new garments and new tools to make these garments, new ways of, of doing it building houses, building um, structures that were, that could regulate temperature better, where you could actually do things. There was, there was a recent paper, I think it was last month, where some physical um, archaeologists were looking at bones of Neanderthals from the Los Huesos cave, I think. And they were saying about what they were finding in the bone, the way the bone was wearing and, and things like that. It was that they were saying they could have been hibernating for most of the winter, like really not doing much. And maybe what you yeah. said, that like the modern humans having so much better clothing. Now, the whole idea of hibernating, I don't buy it, but maybe a Neanderthal population was spending more time in the winter not really doing much. Um, no, I'm glad you brought that paper up, actually. I, I... – I love that that paper came out, but I also hate it because I, I proposed that idea in this paper I have in review right now. <laughs> Doing publication, but I was super happy to see it come out. So this was a homo antecessor at the, at a, in a cave in Spain. And what they found was uh, among hibernating animals, I, I'm going to butcher this explanation, but I think the gist of it is <laughs> the, the, uh, the cancellous bone of hibernating animals grows in a really certain way, like the, the lattice structure of the cancellous bone. And, and basically they did this analysis on homo antecessor cancellous bone and found, that, and found some evidence that they spent annual times of extreme torpor. So the way I explain it in my dissertation is not hibernation, like you think of like a groundhog hibernating, but you know, even, even humans spend some amount of time in torpor on a daily basis when, when we sleep. That's why we love the feeling of thick blankets on top of us because <laughs> it's more metabolic, it's, it's metabolic, metabolically efficient to layer yourself with a bunch of blankets so that your body doesn't have to work to thermoregulate when you sleep. And then in, in societies that live in really cold climates, like the Inuit, I mean, they would spend weeks on end under blankets in, in igloos. Mm -hmm basically just remaining inert 
so that you're not wasting calories and any calories that you are burning can be devoted solely to thermoregulation, to burning fat um, to keep yourself warm. So that, that result came out and it made me, it just, it, it made me really, really happy because I, I really suspected that. And you also see in Neanderthals things like Harris lines and the bones, which means, you know, periods of stunted growth. You see enamel hypoplasia, mm -hmm. another indication of stunted growth. And in my mind, those periods would occur during the winter when you're relatively metabolically inert and probably on the verge of starving because your body is burning so much fat, just trying to keep warm. Got it. Okay. Interesting. I'm glad you had a comment on that. I didn't, I didn't know or not. <clears throat> Good. All right. So what do we got? I got to look at what uh, questions I haven't asked you yet about things. Ah, kind of the last one before I get to your current projects. We got one more question, then you can briefly describe some of your current projects. Now, the the overkill hypothesis, and this is about the megafauna all disappeared in North America at a certain time. And the overkill hypothesis is that modern humans, that they came into this area and the animals like use the term naive, I think, and that the modern humans killed them off. Um, what do you think about that? And what are your ideas about what happened to the megafauna? Was it a combination of factors going on? The climate was changing and had changed. Modern humans did arrive. Dogs also arrived for the first time in, in the Americas with modern humans. So what happened to the megafauna? Uh, also very old school in this. I think people did it. <laughs> <laughs> what this is my Wyoming state archaeologist, man. You better be old school. <laughs> and you better be drinking a PBR. <laughs> so right. I, I'll, uh, I will temper that a little. So I think there was, what, 36 genera in North America that went extinct. Um, wow. I, think, I think that there's, I think that people over hunted some portion of those, directly hunting them. Uh, to, to, at levels that prohibited them from replacing their populations and, and keeping sustainable populations. I think proboscideans are certainly an example of that, mammoths and mastodons. I suspect that camels and horses are as well. Um, I don't think that humans were routinely hunting, for instance, the short-faced bear or the <laughs> saber-toothed cat. I just don't think humans are doing that. But what humans do in those cases is, is uh, replace the niche that those animals occupy and had occupied for mm. hundreds of thousands of years by becoming the top tier predator on the landscape. And uh, through, so through a combination of hunting the base, the prey base, the keystone species of these ecosystems and, and uh, replacing uh, predators as the top tier predator, uh, also probably excluding some animals from niches. So uh, the, the environment that comes to mind is like the, the, uh, the Playa Lake systems in the Southern Plains where you have these really savanna-like environments with very sparse water sources. If humans all of a sudden come on the scene and start monopolizing those sparse resources, mm. um, keeping animals away, that's gonna have an impact on their viability as well. I think this, co this whole conversation though gets confused. I mean, a lot of times people kind of straw man this by like saying, um, well, they didn't kill everything, so it's not overkill. And, and in my mind, that's not really the point. The point is like, if humans hadn't showed up, would they still be here? Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, it's a hypothesis. Either it's true or it's not. Uh, I, I think uh, obviously climate changes things, but you know, they survived a lot of previous climate change in North America. Also, uh, when those climates changed before, they had the option of mobility. You could move out of places that were no longer inhabitable and the other places live just fine when it becomes habitable again you can move back when humans come on the scene start uh inhabiting some of those niches then th that mobility becomes constrained and animals can no longer move around as much uh but either way it's, it's, it's the ultimate cause of all this stuff is people not not anything else in my mind um so I, I'm not as, I'm not quite as hard line as like my you know my advisor my PhD advisor Todd Servo's hard line about it's overkill all the way, and and I'm I mean I'm to, for the most part I'm right there with him, but I I do open up to the possibility of things like uh, you know niche competition basically, but it's still human. 
it's not, not it's not climate. Exactly. Yeah, it, it, I think yeah, people get lost in this simplistic picture of this <laughs> humans leaving this bloody trail of saber toothed tigers and cave bears and stuff on that, <laughs> which yeah, obviously didn't yeah. happen. Okay, good, interesting. Oh man, we. We've already used like as much time as I normally like to use on these. I'm going to have to have you back again. That's just, that's, I have so many other things about North America that I'd like to ask you. Well, I'll have to, I'll just have to bug you again someday. So why don't you go ahead and kind of talk good. about some of the current projects that you're working on? Kind of a plug for Wyoming State Archaeology. And uh, yeah, so what, what are you, what are you doing these days? Yeah, uh, mostly doing the job of uh, Wyoming State Archaeologist, which is, you know, not strictly research-based. We do a lot of public programs. We run this curation facility. I, uh, I'm in charge of responding to human remains discoveries on private and state lands in Wyoming. So I've been doing a lot of uh, body, body recovery stuff. Um, but so, some of the more exciting projects we got going on, uh, we're, we're putting together a handbook of ceramics for, for the state. Um, Wyoming's not really known for its ceramics, but they do pop up a lot. And, and you know, ceramics are probably the best means we have of finding actual ethnicities in the past groups of people mm -hmm. because they're embedded in such a complex network of, of learning. So we're compiling all the ceramic information for the state of Wyoming. We put a book together about it so that people can identify ceramics when they find them, but also give some context to these groups of people and where they're situated on the landscape. Uh, we're also working a lot with the Vore Buffalo Jump Collection. Uh, Vore was, is a uh, buffalo jump that was used 22 times between about AD uh, 1400 and about AD 1700. And it's stratified in the bottom of a sinkhole up in Northeast Wyoming. It's a really remarkable site that was excavated in the early 1970s. Um, that stuff was never really curated fully. So we're, right now we're going through mm -hmm. and curating all of that compiling a bunch of data for it and that's that's funded by the institute for museum and library services uh very generously um and, and other than that we're doing some public programs if anybody wants to participate in them that's listening we, we're always accepting volunteers this summer we're going to be doing an excavation probably at the medicine lodge creek site really nice uh state park up in north central wyoming with a bunch of really great rock art and then we're also doing uh, an excavation just south of town here in laramie and if you want to find information about our office, um, we have a website, just Google Office of the Wyoming State Archaeologist. We've also got a YouTube page uh, that you can look up. We, we have some uh, kind of educational videos there that we filmed last year about making pottery, making paint, about Wyoming rock art, some other topics like that. Um, and then we, we uh, maintain Facebook and Instagram pages as well. Pretty easy to find. Got it. So Wyoming State Archaeology. And people can just go from there, right? Perfect. Yeah, Office of the Wyoming State Archaeologist is the official okay. official name. There we go. Perfect. So great. Contact Spencer, Dr. Pelton, and get involved in, in archaeology and learn. You know, people that live in that area, it's a great way to learn more about your state and the history and the prehistory. So everybody do that. And anybody of my listeners, Milkavad Humla you know, uh, reach out also and, and, and learn a little bit. Well, man, like I said, I got a million things still to ask you. We'll have to do this again sometime. Um, but I think we'll go ahead and end it there. Very good. Um, do you have anything else, any final things you'd like to say? Any final thoughts? No, just yeah. thanks for having me. Great. Uh, you're great. Great interviewer. It's thanks, fun. man. We well, got some it. good, good tips out of me. Thanks. It was nice to get in contact again. I'm glad it's a small world and it looks things are things are coming around and I'm enjoying it. So thank you very much. Um, I'll get in contact you with you again later. And uh, to all our listeners, um, thank you for joining us and um, for this special interview on the Milk of Adumla. And remember to always stay gold. <laughs>